Well, uh, the last couple of weeks we've been working on a spiritual discipline. We started a spiritual discipline series. And the last two weeks we worked on scripture. If you were here last week, it looked a little bit different than what it's going to look like this week and a little bit different than what it looked like two weeks ago. But we're working on spiritual disciplines, things that you can do in your life to grow closer to God. Okay? God wants to have a relationship with you. How can we have that relationship? How can we grow in that relationship? That's what spiritual disciplines are for. And so we spent two weeks looking at Scripture. And now we're going to move into another spiritual discipline called prayer. And maybe you've heard of prayer before. Maybe. The idea of having a conversation with God. And before I get started, I want to talk a little bit about how we talk about prayer in our day-to-day -day lives, and maybe even here as a church, kind of how we talk about things, and I just want us to understand one thing right now. So, we talk about prayer requests. If you have a prayer request, we as the church want to know that prayer request. In fact, there's a slide that comes up every Sunday morning that gives you my cell phone number that says text or call if you have a prayer request. We want to know what that prayer request is. Because we do. But for some reason in the world we live in, and I don't know when this began in churches, prayer requests have become synonymous with the idea of concerns. If you have a prayer request, that means something's going wrong in your life and you need prayers of encouragement to help you up or prayers of healing to lift you up. And those are prayer requests. But so are all the praises in your life. When you see all that God is doing for you, you can, I promise, you can reach out to me and say, hey, I have a prayer request. Look at what God is doing in my life. And guess what? I'm going to say, that's great. I want to share those things, okay? And so praises are not just some extra thing. That is actually part of prayer. And if you have a prayer request, those can be praises too. It's not just about concerns. Because I think if we go throughout our daily lives and we look around at all that God has done for us, we have a lot of things to be thankful for and to be praising God for, okay? And so I just wanted to make sure you understood that about prayer. And when we say as a church, we want your prayer requests, tell the church about your prayer requests so we can be praying for those things, we are also talking about praises. It, it, it's lumped in there, same category, prayer requests, okay? I just wanted to make sure we were tracking that. But this is all part, this series is part of what I was doing on my sabbatical, one of the studies I was doing, and, and I created this thing I'm calling the discipleship wheel. And so it's a circle, and inside in the yellow you have God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, you have the triune God. And then there's a little black line that connects you to all these different spiritual disciplines like scripture, like prayer, like evangelism and witness. And what I encourage you to do is as we go through this, do a self-evaluation of yourself. This isn't where Pastor Scott thinks you belong on this. This is a self-evaluation for you. In your prayer life, how's that going? If you don't pray at all, you might be further away from God when it comes to this spiritual discipline. If you're a prayer warrior, you're praying all the time, you truly pray without ceasing as is talked about in, in, the, in Thessalonians, you might feel like you're a little bit closer to God through that spiritual discipline of prayer. And anyone can do this. Anyone can make this an evaluation of yourselves. And then you can look at it and say, okay, I now see where maybe I need to work in my relationship with God. And you can take it and you can grow from it. 
And so that's what we've been working with here uh, the last couple weeks. If you were not here that first week, I do have a few extra copies of week one over there where we talked about scripture. If you need to get a copy of that and, the, and some of the ideas that when you're reading scripture, what you can do, they're over on that pew way back there. If you want to grab that, you can. But we have two scripture readings for the day. And the first one, I know, it says Pew Bible page and nothing because I forgot to look it up for this one. <laughs> but it is in the Gospel of Mark chapter 5. The Gospel of Mark chapter 5. And it is Pew number page four, uh, 710. Pew Bible page 710. But it's Mark chapter 5. And so I want to tell you what's just happened and if anyone starts reading this and knows what, what story this is, just hang with me. I promise this has to do with prayer. Okay? But Jesus had just calmed the storm. He was out in the boat with his disciples. The storm comes up. The disciples are panicked. They're about to drown and Jesus is asleep at the wheel. And they wake him up, Jesus, don't you care about us? And Jesus wakes up, rebukes the storm. He says, don't you know who I am, basically, is what he says. And the disciples, they become terrified at this, this uh, show of power that Jesus has. And they say, who is this man? They Even the wind and the waves obey him. So that's what's just happened, is this giant show of power on Jesus' part to his disciples. And they ultimately do make it to the other side, and that's where we get in Mark chapter 5, starting in verse 1. And it says this. They went across the lake to the region of the Gerasens, and when Jesus got out of the boat, a man with an evil spirit came from the tombs to meet him. This man lived in the tombs, and no one could bind him any more, not even with a chain. For he had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart and broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones." And when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? Swear to God that you won't torture me. For Jesus had said to him, Come out of this man, you evil spirit. Then Jesus asked him, What is your name? My name is Legion, he replied, for we are many. And he begged Jesus again and again not to send him out of the area. A large herd of pigs was feeding on the nearby hillside. The demons begged Jesus, send us among the pigs, allow us to go into them. He gave them permission. And the evil spirits came out and went into the pigs, and the herd about 2,000 in number, rushed down the steep bank into the lake and were drowned. See, prayer is very clearly talked about in that passage. But really, let's think about this. What is prayer? Prayer is a conversation with God. And that's what we see here is a conversation with Jesus. And I think there's some things we can learn about prayer even in this story of this man who is possessed by a demon, possessed so greatly that the demon himself is doing the talking. What's your name? We are Legion. Okay? So I think there's something we can learn here even from this story. But I think the reason I like this story, I go back to this story for a lot of different things. So I think I was a, a boy, in, you know, 10 years old, and I read this story about this guy 
that was so strong, chains couldn't keep him in. I mean, he was just so powerful. And he lived in a graveyard. What 10-year-old boy doesn't want to hear a story about a guy living in a graveyard that's so strong he can't even be bound? But that's one of the things I think I go back to this story. But I find so much stuff in this story that I'm even using it to talk about prayer. Because look, here is a demon totally unworthy of asking Jesus for anything. And yet the demon did. Ask Jesus. And instead of Jesus being like, no, I'm not listening to you. You're a demon. Why would I ever grant what you want? Jesus did not laugh. He did not mock. He granted the request. Now, there's a difference between demon and people when they go talking to Jesus. But we know demons are not worthy of anything. They are not worthy to have that conversation. But how often do we choose not to go to God in prayer, in conversation, because we think we're not worthy enough? That, oh, I can't ask God for that. Oh, look at my life. Look at how horrible I've been. God's not going to listen to me. God's going to listen. Now, his answer might not be yes, like it was here. It might be no. It might be, hey, you got to wait a while. Not yet. But God is listening to those prayers, and he is answering those prayers. It just might not be with the yes. But it's not, it has nothing to do if you're unworthy or not. And I think so often we put barriers in between us and God that is just totally from our brains. I'm not worthy enough. I haven't done enough for God. I, I've sinned too much. I can't go talk to God. I haven't talked to God in three or four years. I don't want to go talk to him now. Look at how long it's been. These are things that happen in our lives, but that is something we need to get that barrier out because God will listen. He is there for you. He wants to have that relationship. Now, I'm going to say it later on too. Some of our prayers might be short-sighted. We might be praying and we might not we might be asking for something and Jesus is and God is telling us no and we might not be understanding it all. Okay? The demon's prayer was probably short-sighted. I want to stay in this region. I don't want to listen to what you have to say. Okay, stay in this region. Go into these pigs. Sounds great. Then they all die. Okay? Sometimes prayers can be short-sighted. But God is there listening and he is caring for you. Okay? The, the passage we're really going to spend most of the rest of the time on, though, is on Pew Bible, page 848. It's in Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. And the writer of Hebrews here is going to use some Old Testament imagery to talk about Jesus, to talk about God, to talk about that relationship that we have. Because the author of Hebrews is comparing Jesus to the great high priest who would make sacrifices for himself and then make sacrifices for the people in order to uh, absolve the people of their sins in the Old Testament. That was the high priest's job. And the author of Hebrews is going to basically take Jesus and say, he's your high priest. He is the one that can take away your sins. You no longer need this earthly high priest. And so in Hebrews chapter 4, starting in verse 14, we're already into this conversation quite a little bit, but he says this in verse 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet was without sin." Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we 
may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. So in this passage, we see a few things. We see we have this great high priest, and one thing is, don't be afraid to pray big. Have confidence to enter that relationship. Have confidence to pray what you need to pray to God. He is there, he is listening. Don't be afraid to pray big. The other thing is we have these people that are going through some struggles. And we also need to understand, don't be afraid to tell him about your sins and about your temptations and about your weaknesses. Because Jesus understands human weaknesses. He understands those temptations. Now granted, he always chose to say yes to God and no to Satan, and that's where we mess up. We say yes to Satan and sin. But Jesus knows. God knows what those things are like. He knows what it is to be frail and weak like, like we humans are. And I was thinking about this the other day. Uh, I was thinking about this the other day. We have some people, and I'm going to say it's guys. I'm sure women do this too. But I'm going to pick on the men, okay? We have men that feel like they're just this strong bull, this giant tank. I can do anything. You want me to carry 100 pounds, I'll carry 150 just to show you. Okay? We have men like that. Okay? And I, I think back to my childhood, which for many of you would be your adulthood. But I think back to my childhood. Yeah, that was a dig on age, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I think back to my childhood and I think about the cartoon with the Kool-Aid man in it, okay? You have this giant pitcher of red Kool-Aid and he busts through walls trying to save people, making sure kids aren't falling asleep in school and things like that, okay? I think a lot of times men get into this idea that here, we can bust through this wall too, you know. I'm going to go be this big old hero. Now I'm going to give out the very first Mr. Kool-Aid Award of uh, First Christian Church's history, I'm pretty sure. Because as I look out here, I think there is one person that really exemplifies that. I'm a tank. I can go through anything. I can do anything. And so I'm going to give Gary Martin a pair of Kool-Aid socks. <laughs> Got the Kool-Aid man on it. Okay? You know, the only difference between the Kool-Aid man and Gary Martin is the Kool-Aid man actually smiles. <laughs> Gary sits there and he goes... <laughs> Even when he's having a good time. <laughs> so, thinking about that, I thought a little bit about me too. Because one of the things that I'm really good at is I can do anything in the moment and then like I take like three or four days to recover because I'm in a lot of pain. <laughs> okay? Didn't used to be that way. It is now. Didn't used to be that way. But you know, I'll do something and I'll be out and I'll work and I'll do something. I'll, I have a pinched nerve. I understand. I end up getting myself hurt. And Tammy finally goes, Scott, go to the doctor. Scott, go to the doctor. After about a week or so, I decide, okay, maybe I'll just get her to shut up and I'll go to the doctor. I'm, I'm barely walking in, you know. I get to the doctor's office. I'm sitting down. When that doctor walks in, I sit up a little bit straighter. When that doctor says on a scale of 1 to 10 how much pain you have, I'm a 1. Then why are you here? Because we don't want to be honest with the doctor and say, no, I'm actually in a lot of pain. I'm an 8. Okay? Tears came down my face last night. I was a 9. Okay? We don't want to do that. We don't want to be honest with the doctor, even though we know if, if we're going to get healed, if that doctor's going to do anything, we have to be honest with the doctor. But we're not willing to admit it. 
I think sometimes we can do that with prayer. I'm not going to admit my sins. I'm not going to talk to God about my weaknesses and temptations. I don't want to do that. I'm going to hide that from God. How stupid can we be? God knows. He knows what's in your heart. He knows your thoughts. He knows your body. He knows your struggles, your temptations, and your sins. But he wants you to tell him about it. He wants you to admit those things to him. Because guess what? That's how the Holy Spirit begins the process of healing. Just like when you go to that doctor. That doctor doesn't know, but he can't start a process of healing until you're honest with him. That's about prayer too. And I think that's one of the great things about the incarnation. God in man, Jesus living on this earth is we truly do know that our Savior has truly been tempted like we have, has truly felt the weaknesses of going 40 days and 40 nights without food. He knows what that feels like. And so that's our great high priest. We just need to be honest with God about these things. We also see in this passage that you have to know that your prayers might be short-sighted. That you may not realize it, but God does realize it. And here's the issue. I'm not going to read the passage, but if you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it talks a little bit about this. Because it talks about you being short-sighted, that you have a veil on your face, that you're looking through foggy glasses, or you're looking through a mirror. You're not seeing the whole picture. But someday that veil will be lifted. Those glasses will be taken off. And you will truly be in front of God face to face. And you will truly see where God was in your life every single step of the way. So just because you want something and it's not happening doesn't mean that God doesn't love you. In fact, he might love you more because you're not getting what you think you want in the moment. And you just simply don't know. So, let's transition like we did with Scripture. Let's transition and talk about ways that we may be able to pray if you've never prayed before or don't pray a lot and, or maybe you get into a prayer rut where you feel like you're just going through the motions. Let's talk a little bit about some of this. In Scripture, there's a lot of different types of prayer. And I always use the, word, the, the acronym ACTS. Adoration, Confession. Thanksgiving and supplication. These are prayers you can pray in. If you go to the book of Psalms, you're going to see prayers that are nothing but adoration. We love you, God, because of who you are. We don't love you because of what you give us. We love you because of simply who you are as God. You'll see those prayers. You'll see prayers of confession. David, after his incident with Bathsheba, prays, and it's recorded in the Psalms, of his confession and his repentance. And as you read that Psalm, man, I tell you what, I put myself in his place, and I, I tell you what, it can be really emotional getting through that, recognizing what David is going through as he is praying that confession. There's prayers of thanksgiving. Thank you, God, for all you've given us, all you've given me, for my family, for my healings, for whatever it might be. And there's prayers of supplication. God, I need you right now. I need you in this situation or that situation. I have a friend that's needing healing. Those are the kinds of things that are supplication. Inside the realm of supplication, and there could be a difference, I'm going to say it fits under supplication, there's also so something called lament. Where you're just crying out to God, I don't understand what's going on. 
Are you even there, God? Can you imagine saying a prayer and be like, God, are you even there? Guess what? In Scripture, there's several times there's a prayer like that. I don't feel you, God. Help me. Those are all different types of prayer. And in Scripture, there's also a lot of different prayer postures. Bowing, kneeling, laying prostrate. Hands lifted and arms lifted, looking up towards heaven. So if you're ever in conversation with someone and they say, there's only one way to pray, your head has to be bowed, your hands have to be crossed like this, you're wrong. There's a lot of different prayer postures. You can pray standing up, sitting down, laying down. You can do all these things. And sometimes your prayer posture helps you in your prayers. If, if you are confessing, let's just pick one. If you are confessing, if you are struggling with something in your life, sometimes a prayer as you're on your knees and your hands are straight out like you're worshiping God, that posture actually helps you in that time, recognizing God's superiority, and he's going to take care of this. Maybe it is lifting up your arms and crying out, God, I don't understand. Or maybe it's lifting your arms and crying out, God, thank you for what you've given me. Thank you for the forgiveness I've received. There's not just one proper prayer posture. And sometimes those postures can help you with your prayer in expressing those things. In Scripture, there's actually three sounds that come out in prayer. Some are silent. You're praying to yourself. Some are verbal. You're actually using your vocal cords to make a voice. And some of it's just crying out. Maybe it's inaudible words, but it sounds, and you're just simply crying out. We see those in Scripture, people praying that way. Now, there's also different types of prayers that maybe you've never tried, and maybe this would be one of those things that would help you. A prayer walk. You could walk around this town, and you could just simply be praying for the homes that you come to. You could be out in nature, and you could be walking out in nature and just having a conversation with God on your prayer walk. There's a lot of different places where you can go. In fact, if you find a place that has a labyrinth, which is kind of, it's not a maze, it's this path on the ground that you can walk, and they have different things that make you think, like it'll have Bible verses and things like that to make you pray as you walk. You could do a prayer journal. These are always interesting. You can journal your prayers. And then look back in a year or two and see what you prayed and what God's done in response. So you don't just simply forget what you were praying for. You can continually reflect upon God and how He's been answering your prayers. You can pray with others. Not just by yourself, but go get a friend and say, Hey, I want you to pray with me. You know, Tuesday mornings, we have a prayer group here at 10 o'clock. That's what they do. And you can also pray prayers that are already in the Bible. Maybe you want to take the Lord's Prayer and use that as a template for a prayer as you pray. Really, if you want to put in your Google machine, prayers in the Bible we can pray, it's going to spit out a bunch of them. And maybe whatever situation you're going through, maybe you can find somebody that has prayed a prayer that will help you because they've gone through something similar and it's already written down in God's holy word. And maybe that can help you as you pray. So all these different types of prayer. But the one thing I want to remind you is don't forget to listen. Spend some time in silence just listening. Have you ever been in a conversation that's just one way? Sometimes that's not very helpful. You need to sit and listen for a response. But when we pray, do we spend a lot of time simply sitting and listening? 
or is it just simply a one-way conversation you're having? And even when God tries to talk back, you don't hear him because you won't be quiet and listen. Those are things that really do happen. Now, we're going to get ready. I have one other thing if I can quickly get there. Uh, a few weeks ago, someone sent me a message. And I want to read it because it does have something to do with prayer. Hopefully I can find it. If not, we're gonna, I'm going to summarize it maybe. Oh, I knew it wasn't going to work. Okay, that's what you get for trying to do something spur of the moment. I got a message. And it says, how can we pray for you, the minister? I hadn't expressed any prayer requests or prayer concerns to the individual. I just randomly got a message, and it was a little bit longer than what I just said. But it essentially was, how can we be in prayer for you? Because we believe God truly listens to prayers and acts through prayers. Maybe that's something we need to be better at. Just walk up to somebody that is here in the church or even somebody on the side and just simply say, how can we be praying for you? And just see what they say. They could have something really going on in their life and by you saying that, they go, oh, well, let me tell you. And that could open up a conversation about all kinds of things that you can have, not just with individuals within this church, though that'd be great, but even your friends and your neighbors. How can we be praying for you? It's a little different doing it here because a lot of times people don't want to vocalize to everybody as one person standing up here. But on a personal level, just simply say, how can we be praying for you? Not, here, let me tell you about my prayer request. No, tell me about one of yours. And that'd be another way to listen. You're listening to others for their prayer concerns. But let's go ahead, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, we praise you and we thank you for all that you've given us. Lord God, we need to all spend more time in communion with you, in conversation with you. Lord God, we ask you to empower us to where we can truly live out that life of prayer without ceasing. That we are continually and always and fully in community and conversation with you. Lord God, if there's something going on in our lives right now, we want to lift those things up to you. If you're sending us joys and blessings, we want to lift up those thanksgivings to you. If we're going through a hard time in our lives, we want to lift up those cares and anxieties to you. Lord God, if we have friends and family that are going through struggles, we want to lift up their, them to you as well, that you can give them comfort also. But Lord, be with us. We know you are here. We know you are in our presence. Let us continually feel you and let us continually have that conversation with you. In Christ we pray. Amen.